Hello everyone. Welcome to this lecture on uh, Fourier transforms. Uh, this lecture belongs to module 2 of your course and you will find that this lecture is uh, sort of a continuation of uh, the module on uh, Fourier series that you have studied in the previous semester. So uh, this is the plan for this particular lecture. So I shall first introduce you to what is known as integral transforms. So Fourier transforms are basically a special case of a general uh, type of representation of functions and they are known as integral transforms. Then uh, we will dive into Fourier transforms and then uh, we will derive the expression for the Fourier transform and in the process we will also have a look at what is known as the Fourier inversion theorem. Then we will uh, end with uh, a couple of examples. The first example is that of uh, an exponential decay problem and the second example is that of a Gaussian function and finally there will be some exercises for you to solve at home. So uh, basically what is an integral transform? So the moment you hear the word uh, transform it means there is some kind of a change which is happening. So what is this change? So we are basically changing from uh, one kind of a function to another kind of a function. So let's say we are having a function in uh, of one kind of variable and from that kind of va that variable you are going to some other variable and this transformation if we, if it in involves an, in, an integration uh, then it is no, a definite integration then this is known as a integral transform. So let's consider and generically uh, let's consider this. Uh, we have a pair of functions f of t and g of x. And suppose these two functions f of t and g of x they are related to each other by this expression in general. So basically how do you get this g of x? You get this g of x by first taking the function f of t and multiplying it with some other function k. Okay, and this k happens to be a function of both x and t. Okay, so remember for integral transform that means you are trying to transform from uh, one space to another space you are trying to go from the t space to the x space so we have to make a tra transformation from this function to this function so this function is a function of t alone and this is a function of x alone so we have another function k and that function is a function a function of both x as well as t so we multiply this function k with this function f of t and then we integrate this product between a and b with respect to t. So now you see here moment I integrate this product f of t this depends only on t and this function depends on x as well as t. So the moment I integrate this with respect to t from a to b then this result it will no longer be dependent on t it will depend only on x. So whatever is left behind that is known as g of x. So here this a and b they are basically constants and this k of x comma t this is known as, an, as the kernel function. Then if such a relationship between these two functions exists then we say that this g of x is an integral transform of f of t. And we can write this equation number 1 symbolically in this way this g of x is equal to some stylized form of t t f of t I mean basically this is just a shortcut way of writing this is I'm writing this t of I'm applying this uh, operator t on this function f of t so it really means this so when I apply this operator t on this function f of t then basically I'm taking the uh, integration of f of t after multiplying with the kernel function from a to b with respect to t. Now the moment I give this symbol here of, of course it is uh, understood that I know what is this a and what is this b and what is this kernel function. So uh, if uh, for, for uh, I, I could have many different kind of integral transforms and in all these different integral transforms the values of a b and uh, the form of this k that is going to change from function to function. So uh, in equation number 2 you could uh, this was the original trans, uh, integral equation and I am writing it symbolically like this so you can reinterpret this equation as an operator equation so you could look at this integration okay, this integration as, a, as, a, as an operator okay? and the specific transform that uh, we are the, the specific transformation that we are performing that will depend on the specific values of a and b and the form of this function k of x comma t. 
okay uh, so this integral transform process um, uh, it must have these properties the pro of linearity the transform operator t is linear that is if i apply the transformation on a sum of uh, two functions f1 and f2 that is the same as uh, applying the transformation on the individual functions and taking the sum of them okay so it means the transformation of the sum of functions is equal to the sum of the transformation of the functions so that's the first uh, pro uh, condition for linearity so effectively this equation number 3 because i have written this symbolically in terms of this uh, um, uh, operator t but uh, we know that this operator t essentially applying this operator t means you are basically performing this integration so you could again go back to this one and you can say that okay whatever i am passing it over here here is f1 plus f2 that you are basically multiplying with the kernel and integrating it and of course uh, because the integration uh, operation is uh, uh, distributed so i could just distribute this into two uh, break this down into two separate integrals and this of course is the transformation the integral transform of f1 and this is the integral transform of f2 that's the first condition for linearity and the second condition for linearity is the integral transform of a function which is multiplied by some constant okay so if i have a function f of t i multiply it by a constant and then take the integral transform that is the same as first taking the integral transform and then multiplying by the constant so it really does not matter in which order i do this so this again you could just expand this and you could express it like this okay okay so uh, we are uh, interested okay now as you can see here the values of a and b uh, there are like infinite number of infinite combinations of values of a and b and uh, infinite uh, different forms of this kernel function k so what kind of integral transforms are we interested in we are interested in integral transforms that are invertible okay and what do i mean by that what i mean by this that is for this operator this t operator this integral transform operator t there exists an inverse uh, operator t inverse okay such that uh, there is a convenient way by which i can evaluate the reverse of the transformation so it means like i said if i have a function f of t and it undergoes the integral transform it gives me another function g of x then on this g of x if i if i apply some transformation and that transformation if it gives me that function f of t that transformation is known as the inverse of this transformation so we are interested in integral transforms that are invertible that is given this operator t the operator t inverse also exists so uh, these are some important uh, transforms uh, so the first one is uh, of course the fourier transform which we will be studying shortly so fourier transform it is basically i have a function f uh, which is a, uh, uh, which a function f of t and of course here t uh, in most of the cases uh, fourier transform it gives us a transformation from time space to frequency space so that's why we generally like to use t as uh, one variable and omega as another variable so when you apply this here the symbol instead of t we use the symbol f as a stylized form of f and this is given as 1 by root over twice pi integration from minus infinity to plus infinity f of t e to the power minus i omega t dt so this is basically your fourier transform in a uh, the fourier transform of okay, if i go to laplace transform uh, the fourier transform is important uh, because uh, it ap appears in many different uh, um, uh, physical problems it appears in problems in quantum mechanics it appears in uh, signal processing it appears in uh, optics and acoustics and so on then uh, coming to laplace transform uh, the laplace transform is it takes us from uh, again a t space it takes us to a different variable s Uh, I mean, conventionally, this is what we do. The Laplace transform it takes us from a T space to an S space, and here we represent the Laplace transform as a operator L. And this Laplace transform is evaluated in this way. So the function f of t is given. You multiply it with e to the power minus t s, and then you integrate from zero to infinity. Now, Laplace transform they are uh, useful in uh, system or generally they are used in system modeling problems in uh, analysis of electrical and electronic circuits in uh, digital signal processing and as well as in nuclear physics. Then we have another transform which is known as the Hankel transform. Uh, the Hankel transform it takes again from T space it takes us to another space K, okay, and it is uh, the operator is represented as H. 
and this Hankel transform is basically uh, we are multiplying the function with this uh, Bessel uh, functions of order nu and we integrate this from 0 to infinity. So this Hankel transforms are very uh, popular in uh, potential field problems and uh, heat conduction problems, basically any problems which involves uh, uh, Bessel integration of Bessel functions. And finally we have what is known as uh, another example which is known as the Mellin transform. Uh, the operator is symbol is given as uh, M and it takes us from T space to an alpha space and uh, this is how the Mellin transform is evaluated and uh, this is uh, Mellin transforms are uh, very commonly used in uh, the distribution of uh, products and quotients of uh, uh, random variables in uh, probability theory and it is also used in finance, uh, widely used in finance and in geophysics problems. So if in our uh, discussion we will be focusing, will be fo uh, in your course you will be focusing mainly on the Fourier transform and the Laplace transform. Fourier transform is of course the uh, focus of this present module and uh, the last module will be on the Laplace transform. We will not be discussing the Hankel and the Mellin transforms. Now I will just leave it to you as an exercise to just uh, have a look at these different forms of these different transforms, compare it with this general uh, form of any of an integral transform and identify the a b and the kernel functions in all these four cases the Fourier transform the Laplace transform the Hankel transform and the Mellin transform okay so now uh, next question is uh, why do we need to study integral transform so this is a useful diagram which I have just uh, picked up from Arfkin's book so why do we need integral transforms? So, so let's say I have an original problem which has got a very difficult solution. So you want to solve this but solving it is a very very tedious process. Okay? You could solve this, it's not that it's unsolvable, you could sol still solve this but it's going to be extremely tedious before you reach the solution of the original problem. So in that case what do we do? We look for an appropriate um, integral transform. And once we find an integral transform, we, t we translate that original problem into a problem in the uh, transform space okay and then in the transform space the problem becomes very easy to solve and then we quickly solve this and we find out the solution itself in the transform space and then all we have to do is just take an inverse transform and then we get the solution so without going through this difficult route we just take this route and then easily obtain the solution we have done uh, something of this sort in, uh, in your uh, previous semester when we did uh, this uh, modeling uh, in your uh, Scilab, okay, uh, Scilab laboratory where we had uh, modeled uh, different uh, differential equations using x cos. So over there we have basically used uh, this uh, application of integral trans this uh, application of integral transform without you even realizing it. Okay, so uh, coming to the topic at hand, which is a Fourier transform. So, uh, if you recall, uh, like I said at the beginning, the Fourier transform will be uh, like a um, extension of the Fourier series uh, that you had studied in the previous semester. So, a Fourier series, if you recall, it is a basically a, a way to represent functions. So, if I have a function which has got some periodicity, uh, a periodic function which has got some periodicity t, then you could represent this Fourier series, uh, represent that function using what is known as a Fourier series. Okay, so main thing about Fourier series is, a series is the function should have a finite period. But what if the fun function does not have a finite period? What if it has got a infinite period? And when I say infinite period, it means the function is not periodic at all. Okay, so because non-periodic, aperiodic functions can be considered to be functions with infinite periodicity. So in that case, we can we have this generalization of sort of generalization of your Fourier series, and that's where the Fourier transforms they come into the picture. So basically they are the representation of functions which are defined over a over an infinite period. So uh, given a function f of t, its Fourier transform is given as f of omega which is equal to 1 by root 2 pi minus infinity to plus infinity f of t e to the power minus i omega t dt. So you are multiplying this f of t with e to the power minus i omega t and then integrating from minus infinity to plus infinity and the result of this integral you multiply it by 1 by root over twice pi that is going to give you the Fourier transform. So essentially it is taking you from, so if I rep interpret this t as a time then this omega will be our frequency. So it is basically taking you from the time domain into the frequency domain or the time space to the frequency space. 
So, uh, what is the requirement on f of t? The only requirement on f of t is that the it should uh, the the integral of the absolute value of this function it must be finite. The like I said earlier, the, it takes us from a regular uh, t space to a Fourier space. So, uh, before we go into this uh, Fourier space, um, so um, uh, I would like to just uh, introduce you to this notion of this Fourier space just before we uh, derive the expression for the Fourier transform, this expression, I would like to just introduce you to the notion of Fourier space. So, for that I will just take you back to, uh, I would like to take you back to uh, Okay, so I'd like to take you to uh, uh, an illustration of a Fourier space. So let's take an example. Okay, an example of a problem that you have already solved. So if you remember last uh, semester when we studied Fourier series, then I had given you a problem on sawtooth wave, uh, and uh, this is how you can represent a sawtooth wave. Okay, so s of t is equal to k by two. This is the um, zero frequency term and these are the harmonics all the different harmonics okay so here this omega n is the nth harmonic of some fundamental frequency let's call that frequency omega then a omega n will be simply n times omega then uh, this s of t can be simply written as this as you can see here this is the first term this first term does not have any sine or cosine terms that means you could uh, think of it as it's a constant term constant term means it does not have any frequency this is a, this is a zero frequency term then this is frequency equal to omega and this this term has got frequency equal to twice omega this term has got frequency equal to twice omega and so on so sum of all this will give you the sawtooth wave so when you take an infinite sum you'll get a sawtooth wave so basically this is how the sawtooth wave should look like what is being given here so the maximum value that the sawtooth is, go is going to take is k it starts from k by 2 half of k reaches k at half the time period okay and again goes back to 0 and again increases again reaches k again go immediately goes to 0 and again increases so here you can easily you can identify that this is the time period okay from here till here or you could just take this also as the time period subsequently so we have uh, another time period here and one more time period over here so uh, i have just uh, illustrated just to help you uh, remember i have just uh, illustrated this in the form of a python code uh, so i'll just show you the plots that i have obtained from the python code so here so this is the first term this is a constant term right so remember this, this is the first second third and so on so we'll just keep on adding up these different terms and see how the sum changes as we add more and more terms so this is the first term this is a constant term that is k by 2 okay so th this will give me this second plot will give me a mix all the different uh, harmonics which are available to us it will give us a mix and this will be the sum all the terms that are there in this plot we'll just add them up and this will give me the sum so initially we just have now we have one function again that function is a constant function everywhere so this is we have only one function here and then the sum also of course is going to be a constant so here what have we written here uh, these are two numbers which will actually um, uh, parameterize okay the particular harmonic the particular wave that we are uh, representing that means these two numbers contain all the information regarding the wave okay we'll see how so here i have written zero and here i have k by two zero is basically the frequency okay so this function it's a constant function constant function means it has got zero frequency and k by 2 gives us the amplitude what is the amplitude in this example that i am showing you here i have taken k to be equal to 5 so here you can see here this is 2.5 that means the value here is k by 2 as you can see here the value that it takes is k by 2 okay so k by 2 is the value that it takes everywhere so this basically is your amplitude and this is the frequency so frequency and amplitude so it's a constant wave means it has got zero frequency and it's got an amplitude of k by 2 now this is the second uh, term that we have the second term is k by pi sine omega t okay the second term k by pi sine omega t okay so this is going to be simply a sinusoidal function okay again i am i'm writing these two numbers because these two numbers contain all the information that i require to form this wave 
its frequency is omega and its amplitude is k by pi amplitude is k by pi the maximum value that it takes is k by pi so here we have the first previously we had uh, one wave which was a constant right and the second one is this one so we right now we have only uh, we have these two functions and when i add these two functions i'll get the result to be something like this now we bring one more uh, term the second the next term is minus k by 2 sin twice omega t that is this term we bring this also into the mix so here what is the frequency the frequency is twice omega and what is its amplitude its amplitude is minus k by 2 pi i mean this minus sign here it just gives a uh, phase uh, change of pi okay so what was positive is going to become negative that can be interpreted as a additional phase change of pi so we had we had a constant term this was omega that is uh, single uh, the uh, fundamental frequency and this is the uh, twice omega function and we when we add all of them we get something like this you see it's already beginning to look like something like a sawtooth wave now again this is the next uh, component the next component is a has got a frequency of thrice omega so it's got a frequency of thrice omega and it has got an amplitude of k by 3 pi this also comes into the mix and all of them together and you'll get the resultant to be something like this then one more frequency component it's this one's frequency is 4 omega and this one's has got an amplitude of k minus k by 4 pi so we have these five components 1 2 3 4 5 add all of them together the sum is going to be something like this now you see becoming more and more like a sawtooth wave then this is the next component which has got a frequency of phi omega okay add this also into the mix and you'll get something like this so you can see here as we add uh, more and more terms okay initially it was just a just look at this plot in this initially it was just a constant plot then we added the first uh, harmonic then we added the next harmonic and the next harmonic and the next and the next it's becoming more and more like a uh, sawtooth wave if i add sufficient number of components it's going to become eventually it's going to become a sawtooth wave so uh, you can see here i uh, in order to uh, uh, i'm just taking this information from here that is for the first term i call it as zero k by two so this is the frequency and this is the amplitude for the second one this is the frequency and this is the amplitude third one this is the frequency and this is the amplitude fourth this is the frequency and this is the amplitude frequency and amplitude and here also this frequency and this is the amplitude so i'm just taking these uh, numbers okay you can see here this is a set of two numbers you could think of them as uh, coordinates i just take these numbers from here and this uh, set of numbers uh, i could just plot them separately that is you see when the frequency you could look at it this way when the frequency is zero the amplitude is k by 2 and the frequency is omega amplitude is k by pi frequency is 2 omega the amplitude is minus k by 2 pi so if i have a plot on the horizontal axis we have frequency and the vertical axis we have amplitude i could plot these set of numbers over there okay so this set of numbers they contain all the information regarding these waves and when i plot them i get something like this okay so for the zero frequency you can see here over here in the horizontal axis we have frequency and in the vertical axis we have the amplitude of that wave here we are able to see many of these lines each and every line represents one of these waves okay so for instance this wave its frequency is 5 omega this yellow wave its frequency is 5 omega so that yellow wave this wave is represented by this line then this wave is represented by this line and so and so on okay so each and every of these lines represents one one wave okay so we have frequency zero the amplitude is k by two frequency omega the amplitude is k by pi frequency twice omega amplitude is minus k by two pi frequency thrice omega the amplitude is k by three pi and so on okay so uh, here we are writing this in terms of the frequency so what have we done here this was this was how the wave looked like in the time domain and this is what we got from there we extracted the information from this and we got this same information whatever information is contained over here okay whatever is information is contained over here that same information is also contained in all of these different lines now this of course this uh, frequency can be written also in terms of the time period 
okay this time period that we have here the frequency can also be written in terms of the time period in this way the frequency is equal to twice by n by capital T so all I have to do is just change this this omega just replace this is twice by pi by t and then we have 0 2 pi by t 4 pi by t 6 pi by t 8 pi by t 10 pi by t and so on then what is the difference in the frequencies this is the first term what is the next possible because you are not taking all possible frequencies right first we have the zero frequency next immediately the next possible frequency is omega the next possible frequency is twice omega and so on so we are having these kind of quantum jumps of frequencies we are not taking these frequency uh, omega by 2 that is not allowed either is zero or it's omega or it's twice omega and so on okay so what is the difference in the frequency or the, what is called as a frequency jump that difference is frequencies this delta omega that is equal to 2 pi by t okay so uh, coming back to this okay so let's say I have a function f of t okay so wh what we need to uh, take back from here what you need to take from here is this expression that is the frequency jump that is from one term to the next term the difference in the frequency is given by 2 pi by t where t is a time period the time period of what is this t this t is this time period of this function okay this will come to us in handy so now coming back to this so if I have a function f of t okay which has got a period capital T then we can represent this by as a complex Fourier series we have discussed this in the previous semester so f of t can be written simply as a summation and goes from minus infinity to plus infinity c n e to the power i omega n t and here this coefficient c of n they are given by this basically you are integrating f of t okay multiplied by e to the power minus twice pi i n t by t from minus t by 2 to plus t by 2 and dividing the result by t now uh, this frequency jumps we saw this frequency jumps that is from one frequency to the next to the next frequency the difference is 2 pi by capital T so it has uh, the idea what is the idea here the idea is we are go we are going from Fourier series to Fourier transform there is the idea is we want to represent functions which are defined over an infinite period so here the finite period for Fourier series the period is finite that means t is finite but if you want to apply a Fourier transform then we are talking about t which is infinite okay so we have the difference between one uh, harmonic and the next harmonic the frequency difference that difference is 2 pi by t then as this period if as long as this remains finite then this is going to remain finite but we are interested in Fourier transform so that means we are going to allow this t that the period to be infinite so as t tends towards infinity then this delta omega it will become infinitesimally small and I could just replace instead of delta omega we could just write it as d omega and the moment this delta omega becomes small then this omega n it becomes a continuous variable instead of calling it as omega n we'll just call it as omega because it's a it's now going to be a continuous variable not a discrete variable unlike in the previous in, in case of Fourier series it was just this uh, discrete variables we had one line another line and so on so omega were take omega, omega was taking only discrete values but here omega is no longer going to take a discrete value it's going to take continuous values okay so when in 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 the in the case of Fourier transforms that means we are uh, going to allow functions to have infinite um, time period okay infinite period that is t tends towards infinity the frequency jumps are going to become infinitesimally small and the frequencies are no longer going to be discrete but they are going to become continuous variables omega so that's a key idea that we need to keep in mind so then equation number two what will equation number two become okay in equation number two we just substitute okay one by t t is equal to omega by 2 pi so I take this t here and then uh, 2 pi by delta omega and then you are taking 1 by t so we will get a delta omega by 2 pi so we just replace 1 by t with delta omega by 2 pi the limits will be minus t by 2 to plus t by 2 and then f of t I mean we could just instead of using just uh, to avoid a confusion I will just replace this t with uh, another dummy variable u okay and here this 2 pi by t I'll just replace it 2 pi n by t I'll just replace it with omega n so omega n into u into du so I just rewrite this uh, coefficients these coefficients I rewrite them in terms of omega n's like this using a dummy variable which really does not matter because we're anyway we're going to integrate this 
so this is this integral will be anyway independent of u so it does not matter whether you use u as the integration variable or t as the integration variable okay so now what we'll do is we'll just use this let's uh, insert this equation number three in equation number one so instead of this c we we'll just substitute this entire thing so you'll get f of t is equal to so we had this summation summation and then c n instead of c n we just rep replace this e to the power i omega n t so now we just do some kind of uh, shuffling here i'll take the 1 by 2 pi outside then we have a summation then uh, this delta omega i'll take it outside okay so we have this quantity that is integration from minus t by t to plus t by 2 f of u e to the power minus i omega and u du so this quantity i'll call it as g of omega n because as you can see here you are integrating with respect to u okay the moment you integrate with respect to u this is no longer going to be dependent on u it will depend only on omega n so this will be a function of omega n so let's call this function as g of omega n so that means f of t can be written as 1 by twice pi integration sorry summation n going from minus infinity to plus infinity this entire thing is g of omega n e to the power i omega n t into d omega we'll just call this as equation number four so uh, here uh, of course just to recall uh, just to write this down as a separate equation this g of omega n is basically this integral so i'm just calling this as equation number five okay so this is equation number four f of t and this is equation number five which gives us g of omega n what is just g of omega n that is equation number five Okay, now again recall as t tends towards infinity what happens delta omega it becomes uh, differential and omega n becomes a continuous a discrete variable discrete frequencies become a continuous frequency and the summation is going to become an integration so this is going to become an integration okay so this equation number five what does what happens in equation number five g of omega n will become g of omega because omega n it, it now becomes a continuous variable and uh, because t tends towards infinity here the lower limit will be minus infinity and the upper limit will be plus infinity f of u e to the power i omega n again i'll write it as omega u and du so we'll just call this as equation number six and in equation number four what do we get so we have one by two pi and like i said as t tends towards infinity the summation becomes and um, summation becomes an integral so this is going to become an integral the lower limit will be minus infinity upper limit will be plus infinity g of omega n is going to become g of omega e to the power i omega n omega n becomes omega here and this delta omega as we saw here delta omega will become d omega we'll just make the substitution accordingly so we'll just call this as equation number seven so and uh, we could uh, we could just leave this equation as it is okay so this is this g of omega in this case it is going to give me the fourier transform that we are looking for if we just leave it as it is this g of omega will give me the fourier transform and in fact in many textbooks they actually do that they just call this whatever is there inside this g of omega that is called as the fourier transform because it it satisfies uh, all the requirements of a uh, of, of an integral transform so this g of omega itself i could call it as a fourier transform in Arfkin's book, they use this definition of a Fourier transform. Or what we could do is we could uh, make it look more symmetric. Okay, so what we could do is this one by two pi this, that we have outside, we could split this up into one by root two pi and one by root two pi. Okay, and that one by root two pi you keep it here, and the other one by root two pi you take it inside. Okay. So g omega by under root, uh, root over 2 pi and this other root, uh, uh, root over 2 pi you keep it outside here. Then this combination that is g of omega divided by root over twice pi you call it as f of omega and this also we can define as the Fourier transform of f of t. Okay. So you could either use call this as the Fourier transform or you would call this as the Fourier transform. The advantage of this is when you uh, call this as a Fourier transform, then the Fourier transform and the inverse Fourier transform, they will become really symmetric as we will see. So from uh, equation number 8 and equation number 6, this is equation number 6, equation number 6 is this, it gives me what is uh, g of omega and uh, we say that f of omega is g of omega by root 2 pi, so you just substitute g of omega from equation number 6 and divide this by root over 2 pi. 
that gives us the Fourier transform of f of t that is f of omega is equal to 1 by root 2 pi integration minus infinity to plus infinity f of t e to the power minus i omega t dt that gives this gives us the Fourier transform of this f of t and again from equation number 8 itself we can obtain the inverse okay because what is this this is nothing but the Fourier transform f of omega so f of t is equal to 1 by root over twice pi in integration from minus infinity to plus infinity f of omega e to the power i omega t d omega so you can see here the Fourier transform and this is the inverse Fourier transform okay this is the Fourier this is the Fourier transform because it takes us from time domain to the frequency domain this is the inverse Fourier transform because it takes us from the frequency domain back to the time domain as you can see here they are very pretty much symmetric the kernel function here e to the power minus i omega t and here the kernel function is e to the power i omega t they are basically complex conjugates of each other so this is the reason why we split up this constant here even if you don't do it doesn't really matter it will uh, still be a Fourier transform okay so uh, we had this equation number six and equation number seven here so if we just substitute this equation number six in equation number seven this equation number six if we just substitute in equation number seven you will get f of t is equal to one by two pi integration minus infinity plus infinity d omega e to the power i omega t and this g of omega i just substitute replace with this one and we get this so this is known this result is known, known as the Fourier inversion theorem essentially why it's called the Fourier inversion theorem it's very simple it says basically that if I take the uh, Fourier transform of a function and then I do the inverse Fourier transform then I should get back the original function so, okay that's an important result for so no, it's very it looks very trivial but I mean it's a good result to remember